don't like to take sides. I love dogs and I love cats. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I love them for different reasons. And the reasons are I love the dogginess of dogs and the cattiness of cats. <laughs> and they each have special things that they bring to our cat-human or dog-human relationship. And, and I think it's worthy pointing out exactly what you can get from your cat that some people may not know. Sorry for saying Sorry Media presents the Purr Podcast, the best podcast for feline medicine and surgery with tips, tricks, and updates for the entire veterinary healthcare team. If you're dying to know more about cats, keep on listening. Here are your hosts, Dr. Susan Little, famous cat vet and textbook author, and Dr. Yola Kerpenstein, talented surgeon and social media geek. Hello, this is Dr. Yola Kerpenstein. And this is Dr. Susan Little. And we are very excited because we have a special guest. Yes, we have someone who's as much or more of a cat person than I am. We have Dr. Deborah Horwitz with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks I'm so pleased coming. to be here. I know. It's exciting. And we are going to talk about all sorts of fun stuff. And so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, I'm a veterinary behaviorist, which means I'm a veterinarian and board certified in the specialty of behavior. And I don't like to take sides. I love dogs and I love cats. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I love them for different reasons. And the reasons are I love the dogginess of dogs and the cattiness of cats. (laughs) And they each have special things that they bring to our cat-human or dog-human relationship. And and I think it's worthy pointing out exactly what you can get from your cat that some people may not know. And this is a wonderful introduction. And we forgot to tell you that Uh the D word is really not allowed in this podcast. (laughs) You have to find a creative way. I know. So you have to create a way to to (laughs) talk about the other species. It's a little challenge. Can we call them? The lesser species. That's what we call them. We call them the lesser species. The lesser species? (laughs) The furrier species? The other species. The other species? All is fine. Just no D word. There's no D word. Okay, yeah. so do I have to start over? No. Uh, no, 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 no. I have a question for you. How do you become a behaviorologist? And I can Behavior- hardly pronounce behaviorist, it. Behaviorist, yeah. It's yeah. a behaviorist. Right. No way out. Yes. Well, we now have a college, American College of Veterinary Behaviorists, although mm-hmm. my training predates the formation of the college. But now we have regular programs like any other specialty. Mm-hmm. So if you want to become a boarded behaviorist, you can do a college-based residency or a home-based residency where you have someone who's your mentor and you may either learn in their practice or the mentor may come to you. And then we have standards for what kind of courses you must take, how many ca- how many cases you have to see, and what kind you have to write three case reports which are judged by your peers and have a published article in a peer review magazine. And then when you do all of that, you get to sit for a two-day exam. It's, it's absolutely Ooh-hoo. wonderful. <laughs> So that, that's quite a path that you have mm. to take to become a behaviorist. And, you know, I don't know why I cannot pronounce that word. <laughs> because it's everyone wants to put an AL, AL in there. Yeah. So it's a behaviorist, like dermatologist. We just don't have the gist. Behaviorist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, behaviorist. got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it, got it. So um, were you in regular general practice before, or what, what was your path yes. from graduation? I was in general practice for... A number of years doing all sorts of species. Yes. Cats being among them. Yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, At one time, actually, this little factoid that people listening may not know, a colleague and I almost opened a cat practice. (gasps) I did not know that. No way. Really? Yes, in in a suburb of Detroit. Mm. And I actually decided that that was not the path I wanted to go down and that I was more interested in doing behavior because that kind of spoke to me Mm -hmm. but my friend went on to form a cat practice and Ah. it was very successful and I've always had a really deep interest in cats the first pets that I owned as a child were cats and I just uh, yeah you know I always think of you as one of the best cat behaviorists because oh my thank you but but you know as veterinarians we're all sometimes better in one area than in Mm -hmm. other areas Mm -hmm. it's just you know we're normal people right and uh, not all behaviors well that's true (laughs) (laughs) that's true I totally agree with and, you. And there's quite a lot of discussion about cat behavior. We had a couple of people already on We the had podcast. Terry Curtis um, chat with us. She mm-hmm. talked yeah. a, a lot about sort of house soiling problems and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, and, and, but I also think it's not completely fair that cat behavior is so high on the list of what people say there are problems because I ah. think you need to, it is, I don't think the cat behavior is a problem. I think our perception of the cat yeah. behavior is a problem. Well, here's the way I look at it. 
is that when you're assessing any any case in veterinary medicine, whether it's a medical or a behavioral one, the first thing you want to try to determine is it normal or is it abnormal? Mm. Or if it's normal, is it unwanted? Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, even there are medical things that are unwanted, but they're not abnormal. And in behavior, there are often behaviors that are not abnormal. Mm. There is no dysfunction in the way the animal looks at the world or interfaces with its environment or the people in it. But there are unwanted behaviors. And usually unwanted behaviors are misunderstood behaviors that are not being provided the appropriate outlets Mm -hmm. for how to express them in a way Mm -hmm. that is not problematic for the people they live with. And so I think the difference between other species and cats is that they've evolved to be with us in a different way. Hmm. So you 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 were you mentioned earlier before we we, we started chatting on the podcast that um, you have a way of thinking about people who say they don't like cats, right? When you think about other species that we utilize day to day, and there are any number of them, there are farm animals, there are other companion mm-hmm. animals. Yeah. They have co-evolved for us with us using them. And directing them to right. get things done, mm-hmm. influencing their ev- ev- and, and evolution, changing, right? and changing, and changing them. what we're taking some of their normal behaviors and we're channeling them so they're under our control. Mm. So it yeah, can you be, don't want to have a wolf in the house. No. I mean, you, you don't know. want to have a wolf in the house, and you don't want to have a cow in the house either. No. Yeah, yeah. So you channel milk production yeah. in a way that helps you yeah. without having to live with a cow in your house. Exactly. Yeah. When it comes to cats, cats also co-evolved with us. But we had this this experience with them as they came close to where people lived because we had something they wanted that we didn't want. In other species, they have something that they have that we want. Right. But cats, we had something they wanted that we didn't want, and that's vermin. Mm. That's mice. Mm. And so they became domesticated by doing something for us that was so desirable, which was going to our grain stores and killing the mice. And therefore, we didn't have to teach them what to do. It's a natural feline behavior. And we haven't spent a lot of time trying to direct them to do things, but that doesn't mean that we can't. You know, I often think cats kind of domesticated themselves in a way. It was to their advantage to hang around people. Absolutely, but it was also to the advantage of other species as well. They got better care, they got better food, they had more reliable, comfortable dwellings. So all those species, it was to their advantage, but many of them needed our direction and the cat did not. And I I get that part, but then I go a little further to push your, to push a little bit backwards to your theory, because... So for the domestic short hair, I can get that. You know, it's kind of a, a mix. But now we're going into the the breed specific cats that we have tried to manipulate as yeah. far as we could. Now we have a naked cat. You yeah. know, how does that fit? But that's in your form, theory? not function, right? Correct. Yeah, uh, I we have done that in other domesticated mm-hmm. animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we have changed cattle, for example, where the to increase their form. Mm-hmm which doesn't necessarily change their function. Mm. And we have done it with horses, for Mm. example, again, to make them taller or faster or smaller and stronger. And so any species that we put our hands on, we Mm. want to manipulate. But it doesn't change the essence of the cat Mm. to be able to do certain cat-like things just because they look different. And that's the same with all sorts of species uh, that people live with. But isn't it possible that cats are more difficult to manipulate in that way so it's easier to so you can you know i can change the cat hair color and i can change the how much hair they have but i cannot change that behavior that much because it is so ingrained in them instead of a dog being kind of gullible but that's not the case, okay? And I'm happy you pointed it out to me because <laughs> yes. you're right. I yeah. did say the D word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. what I you can't see on the podcast is that, that yeah. <laughs> uh, Debbie pretty quickly picked yeah, up on the yeah. D word there. Good Excellent. girl. But here's the thing. Yes. We have co-evolved in directing dogs. We have never tried to direct cats. And that doesn't mean that we can't. What we do when we want to direct a dog, what do we do when we want to direct a dog? We put an appliance on them so we can hold on to them, Mm. correct? Yes. That's always something we do. Mm. Yes. We have not done that with cats. Except for Bug. Do you you know Bug? Bug the cat. 
Bug the cat's at your cat? No. no, no, no. So he's owned by a vet named Ken Lambrecht, and you often see him at, at shows. I've seen a lot of cats yeah. that wear appliances. Yes. And so one of the things that came to me is drug detection mm. or bomb detection. Oh, Dogs wow. can go lots of places, but there are places they can't go that cats couldn't. Yeah. Cats can smell just as well as dogs, yeah. and you could train them to signal when they smelled it. You just also would have to train them to wear a harness and a leash. Mm. I never thought of that. They can, I mean, a dog I can't go in the attic. Yeah, yeah. I love that idea. That is amazing. I love that idea. Isn't that a no, great idea? It, is it a great absolutely idea. is. And so I think we haven't utilized no. cats to mm. their fullest mm. because they have a lot of innate abilities mm. that they don't mind showing us how they can do it because they climb our curtains all the time mm. or they end up on the top of our bookshelves mm. or our refrigerators. They obviously are very agile mm -hmm. and we should explore that not just to utilize them but to enrich them mm -hmm. and make their life better because they're so acrobatic mm. and so graceful whether they have lots of hair or not very much if they have lots of hair the biggest problem they have spent so much time grooming themselves mm. which mm. is a downside i think the other thing is that cat breeds in general are a phenomenon that's only about 100 years old correct right dog breeds are many hundreds are, are, and hundreds yeah. of years old. so mm. we've only recently even tried to manipulate color and mm -hmm. coat length that's right yeah mm -hmm. that's right yeah. and cat breeds do vary mm. in their they propensities do. to do certain things like vocalize they do. to jump mm -hmm. so i i, I was it's just there. i was just showing a video in my last lecture of a a cat doing agility an eight-month-old uh, kid I, lo I love seeing those. And someone came up and told me that there are some cat shows that actually have... They have ag agility trials. They have agility yes. trials. Yes, And I would bet that there are some breeds of cats that are better than others. And the other interesting mm -hmm. thing is they took out the weave poles because it's too easy for cats. Yeah. I mean, a cat could probably beat a border collie every time. <laughs> every time. The really? weave poles because the yeah. they're so fast. Yeah. And it is really only recently that people have grabbed on to the, the athletic ability and the intellects that's theirs yeah. and and directed it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And we we never directed cats no. because we just let them do what they want to do because they're fascinating, let's face mm. it. Yeah. I just have to talk a little bit about domestication of the cat because that goes thousands of years, not hundreds. No, that's domestication, it, but it's not breeds. It's not mm -hmm. breeds. Breeds. Uh, yeah. Cats, Developing breeds is only about 100 it's, years. I, I think that the Egyptians were doing something. Not, like not breeds, though. You're sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, I, I think actually that you might have a point mm. because... Cats evolved from small desert cats yeah. as well as the small European cats. Yeah. There are two lines of evolution. But if you look at the drawings of cats that you see in hieroglyphics, just like when you look at the drawings of he who shall not be named mm -hmm. in the hieroglyphics, mm -hmm. they have a specific look to, mm -hmm. uh, to a very old breed of dogs. That's true. And mm -hmm. I think that some of the older breeds of cats, mm -hmm. uh, which I think might be Siamese actually, and um, maybe, you know, Bur like Karat, Burmese, those guys. Mm -hmm. Those guys have been around for a long time, mm -hmm. but the actual number of breeds that we have now is That's relatively. That's phenomenon. Right? Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that does make that sense. So the, okay. uh, yeah. it's, a, it's really a toss up who mm -hmm. has lived with humans longer. So mm -hmm. domestication and living with humans are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because when cats first started living near humans, I don't know that they were actually domesticated. Mm. I, I haven't done the research, and I'm not an anthropologist. Mm. But dogs had to be domesticated to some point because we put our hands on them. Yeah. You know, they hunted for us. Mm. And, yeah. I'm different sorry. Different relationship. Right. Yeah, different right. relationship. Yeah. The Wind Feline Foundation has been funding cat health studies for 51 years. If you have a cat or have ever treated a cat, nearly everything we know was once funded by this nonprofit, totaling about $6.5 million. From understanding retroviruses, FELV and FIV, to more recently targeting gene defects responsible for HCM in the Ragdoll and Maine Coon breeds. The Wind Feline Foundation Pet Memorial Program offers veterinary professionals an opportunity to reassure clients that their beloved cats have not been forgotten. And those dollars support health studies that benefit the lives of all cats. 
Contributions totaling $150 or more receive a certificate suitable for framing or display in your clinic. Imagine being able to treat kidney disease more effectively, using stem cell therapy to cure stomatitis, or drugs that treat FIP are actually within grasp. Consider your support in telling your clients about the WinFeline Foundation and a free newsletter at winfelinefoundation.org. I'm guessing that a lot of what you do when you're working with clients is explaining cats to people. It's, it's explaining cats to people, and it's also trying to see the world through a cat's eyes. And then going through this, well, is this a normal but unwanted behavior, or is it an abnormal behavior? And if it's a normal but unwanted behavior, then how can we channel it in a way that's acceptable to both the cat and you? If it's an abnormal behavior, then what's driving it? Is Mm. the environment? Is it an illness? Mm. Is it something in their genetics? Is it something in their early environment? And all of that needs to be covered. And um, people have to leave behind this idea that their animals are spiteful, oh, yeah. uh, are out to get them. They give them human emotions. Yeah. To give them negative emotions. Yeah, negative emotions. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, I fear is a negative emotion, I guess, and anxiety is a negative emotion. But spiteful behavior, the true definition of spiteful behavior, is a behavior that doesn't benefit the sender or the receiver. Okay. And it's a very complicated concept. You have to be willing to say, I am going to engage in a behavior whose outcome will not benefit me in any way. When most animals engage in behaviors based on the cost-benefit ratio, Mm. and you're more likely to engage in behaviors that benefit you. Mm. So spiteful behaviors are uncommon in the animal kingdom because they're of no benefit. Yeah, there's no benefit. There's no need. There's no need to do that. Right. It's a very complex thing to think, okay, you left for work, and I'm unhappy that you left for work, so let's see, which curtains haven't I ripped down today? Hmm. Maybe the ones over your bed. Let's go there. Um, and- so do we know in the animal world uh, examples, except for humans, because they can be right. spiteful, uh, of any other species that do portrays those, like, complex spiteful behaviors behavior? Like that, yeah. Hmm. Good question. I can't really think of an example. Animals do exhibit altruistic behavior, though. Mm -hmm. For example, um, juvenile animals will stay and help raise the next generation, which is altruistic because the goal of life is to put your genes in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And if you stay and raise the ones of the next litter of the same breeding pair, they do share some of your gene pool so it does Mm. help you but every year or so that you delay in reproducing is a year that you you may not there's a cost to that so it isn't always to your benefit to do everything but um Hmm. i would imagine that if there was spiteful behavior it would more likely be in the primates yeah that's what i was thinking Mm. probably chimpanzees and i remember something Mm. from my schooling uh, we have yeah. a very famous behaviorologist in Chimacis, which is uh, uh, who uh, worked at Utrecht University, and he was talking about that uh, chimps and gorillas have behaviors that right are you know, spiteful. Yeah, exactly. And the only other, the only feline behavior that I would say might qualify as spiteful is what a male lion does when he takes over pride and he kills all the young it's animals, all the cubs. But but that, that's to his benefit, That's though, to no? his benefit, yeah. mm. absolutely, because it's not his gene pool. Yeah. And his job is to put his genes on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not really, it's spiteful in one sense in yeah. that the lioness is losing yeah. this genetic contribution that's a lot of work and is yeah. life-threatening for her. Absolutely. But it's not particularly spiteful for him unless she turns around and attacks him or something of that nature. But in yeah. general, spiteful behavior. I'm sure there are examples of it. Not common, it, though. It would be in group living yeah. animals. It's, it's funny because uh, I always think about the praying mantras. Man, man, hey, praying mantis? mantis ah. And the black widow who kills oh, their male. Right, right. But they do it because of the protein source. It's food. Right. Well, it's not spiteful. They kill and eat it, right? Mm-hmm. They ah, kill and ah, eat it. Yeah. But hmm. the male has to 
the male doesn't know, I guess, that it's going to die. Presumably. Presumably. <laughs> yeah, but the overwhelming <laughs> urge for the male is to reproduce. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he's, he's gotten what he's he done. needed to do. That's Check. right. And there you go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Listen, okay. I always say that sometimes I think that humans would be better off if we recognize that there are needs that we are biologically programmed to fulfill. Mm. like putting our genes in the next generation or being suspicious of the other. Think about all sorts of animals. They recognize members of their group yeah. and are suspicious of others. Of others. Not because they are, you know, breedist or elitist <laughs> or whatever, right, right, but right. what you don't know can hurt you. Yeah. So that uh, I think a very ancient uh, behavior, don't you think? Like yes. It's a very fundamental. Yes. It's, yeah. it's like those experiments where they put babies on a glass table. Have you ever heard about those? No. no. And it's called the cliff experiments. And, and they crawl and then... Um, and they can see... Th when they see through the glass, it's solid. And when they get to a certain part, there's a cliff. And the babies automatically, they stop. Uh -huh. really? They stop. Nobody has to teach them that. It's like... Uh, it's like a hardwired reaction. It's a hardwired yeah. thing that there's nothing underneath me. I can see through it, and it's danger. Gotcha. So there are a lot of behaviors that are hardwired that we just go, oh, well, yeah. you know, of course they stop. But yeah. it's not of course, because if babies weren't programmed to do that, yeah. they crawl away from their parents and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So let, let's get back to cats, because... I've also heard you, so you, you, you said that people who say they don't like cats have not met the right cat, right? So I, I want to explore that a bit because, especially if you don't know cats, you tend to think they're all of the same personality, right? Like they're all aloof, they're all independent, they all don't like people. And we know that's not true. Well, I don't think that any cat who has been raised with input from people dislikes them totally, mm. okay? But I do think if we want to put it in human terms, there's gregarious cats, mm -hmm. There's introverted cats, and there are very assertive cats, and they all express the way they in, mm. interact with their environment differently. And if people have met only introverted cats, then they probably feel the same way about them as they do when they go to a party and they meet someone, they introduce themselves, and then the next time they see them and they go to wave and that person mm. right, walks right on by. It's not because they don't like them, but because the person is like, okay, just because I talked to you for 10 minutes, yeah. I, I don't really like talking to that many people. Yeah. And cats can be the same way. Uh, and mm -hmm. other people don't like really gregarious cats. Yeah. Not all cats are party animals. Mm. Not all cats are party <laughs> animals. Yeah. But first of all, I think that anyone who doesn't like cats just has to sit with a friendly, calm cat on their lap and feel it purr, oh. and they'll be sold. Oh. <laughs> I do, because purring is, is such a resonant yeah. uh behavior yeah. that resonates with blood pressure yes. and it's very very mm. calming, calming. Yes. and yeah. um, if you can get over the fact that they're so quiet a lot of people don't like cats because they're, they're so quiet. quiet because they're there yeah. and I have a friend like that she goes oh, there's your cat and I said what do you, what do you think she, <laughs> yeah. she's gonna do to you yeah you have to talk about your Westie Oh, okay, I will. <laughs> His name was Oscar. Oscar. He was very cute. That's a great name. But one of the things people talk about is that cats are so quiet. Mm -hmm. And I had this Westie who could walk without making any noise. He would not jangle he his, like his, tags, his or? tags or anything. And he would just show up. There he was. And so if people are are scared by cats being quiet, then that is... A function of them being a little jittery about things and not. Cats are quiet because I think the more you understand about their normal behavior, the, the more it helps, right? The more it yeah. helps. Cats are the most efficient predators on the planet. They are amazing at catching things. There also are domestic cats that are really the only ones, except for bobcats and the small wildcats, who are also prey. Mm -hmm. So if you're also prey, when you're prey, think horses. What do horses do when they're scared? They're gone. Mm -hmm. And what do cats do when they're scared? They're, they're gone. gone. So when people come to the house and they're not used to a lot of people, they're just going to go and hide because it's not like we can tap them on the shoulder and say, by the way, kitty cat, mm -hmm. these people are not going to eat you. <laughs> and the cat is probably thinking, how do I know that? How do I know that? I have yeah, not met them yeah, before. Yeah. I swear, I have had cats come into my practice like all of their lifetime. 
you know, and so you think they get to know you. They, right. But but every year they come in and they go, it could be this year. This yes. year right. could be the year. That she's yeah. going to do something yeah. dastardly. It could be today, today right. you right. know. <laughs> but it's that hardwired protective mechanism because they're also a prey species. So can, yes. I, can I ask you a question? So, and, and I love history, so I'm going back to the history. Why <laughs> do cats have a bad rep in history? Because oh, they, they are do. seen to be, like the you witches know, it's familiar, witches, the bad luck. The black cats, you know, there's a lot of negativity yeah. surrounding cats. Well, Why first of it? all, uh, black has always been considered a dangerous color. Mm. But you have black dogs too, and I can't remember that my Bouvier, uh, the Flanders, was ever seen as a dark, evil dog. It's like mm. a... Well, I, I do think... First of all, it was a guard dog, Mm. and it was black because it is more imposing Mm. to have a black dog, a large black dog whose eyes you can't see, guard your property, than a little tiny dog with a face that looks like a baby's. That's that's part of it. Mm. Uh, Black cats were associated with black magic, Mm. and and there is a whole thing in um, medieval times about things happening, and they're happening because... There are bad currents in the world, and we don't know what causes them, the plague and the this and the that. And so um, cats, don't, cats don't respond to humans' verbal interaction with them, and that you feel like you have no control. Mm. And in many ways, unless you teach them, you don't. Mm. But you don't have any control over a dog. That, I mean, people don't get as freaked out when you call your dog and it doesn't come. True. As, they just don't. But yeah, yeah. I, that is for another podcast yeah, with yeah. some <laughs> other people who do the D word. Yeah, the D word, exactly. But, um, yeah, yeah. yeah so I, you, think you, it, you, I think black is, is evil. When you look at um, history, mm. the, the Crusades, what color did they wear? Mm-hmm. What color? Uh, white. White, yeah. right? What did the people who lived in the desert and things, what did they wear? Sometimes they wore dark colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes. So, so your enemies were often clothed different. White is the color of purity, and black is the The color of evil. So, and cats are enigmatic? Yeah, enigmatic. Enigmatic. Right, Mm -hmm. so it's easier to ascribe these darker And But if you go look at at animals that are black and what they evoke in people, it's a little awe and a little bit of fear. Big black dogs. Yeah. A a big black uh, mastiff. Yeah. This is not a cuddly dog. So this was wonderful. Uh, I'm really excited that you'll be back in two weeks uh, <laughs> talking about even more cat facts, cat uh, talk. We, we're going to just uh, I know. We just it. should call this cat, I, talk. cat I talk. I like that. Talk. And yeah. I think you should have purr among yourselves. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh purr among yourselves. Oh, that is very good. Very oh, good. I so love thank it. you so much for, uh, for doing the first part of our podcast. And uh, we're so much. My involved. pleasure. Yeah, we can't wait. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you. The opinions of this podcast are those by Dr. Susan Little and Dr. Yola Kirpenstein. Veterinary medicine is a complex profession, and often there are multiple diagnostic and therapeutic options for different disease processes. If you're a pet owner with questions, please go to your local veterinarian. If you're a veterinary professional, ask your questions on our Instagram page, at Per Podcast. Dr. Susan Little is a feline medicine specialist with two cat-only hospitals in Ottawa, Canada. She is best known as an international speaker and as the author and editor of two textbooks, The Cat, Clinical Medicine and Management, and August, Consultations in Feline Internal Medicine. Along with three cats, she also admits to owning two dogs, and you can follow her on social media with the handle at Cat Pet Susan. Dr. Yurla Kirpenstein is a diplomate of the American and European College of Veterinary Surgeons and a big cat fan. His specialties range from surgical oncology and reconstruction to minimally invasive surgery. He is the author of two textbooks on basic and reconstructive surgery. Did you know he was allergic to cats? Yola works currently at Hills Pet Nutrition. You can follow him on social media with the handle at GBE. TSX. 